Good morning. Welcome to Newswire here on Sports Grid. Craig Mish here with you. We got a lot to cover on today's show. Of course, the very latest in the National Basketball Association. And as we head toward the Final Four on the men's and women's side, some recaps and some previews as well. Mike Mazio also will be with us from Legal Sports Report. And with the Masters almost one week away, Brady Cannon will join us for the preview before the Masters, because we got the uh, Texas Open going on this weekend as well. So plenty to cover with you here on today's show. Stick around for the ride as we're here with you every day, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern on the show. And if you were not watching the NBA or the NHL or maybe some baseball yesterday, perhaps it was the Women's NCAA Tournament and the incredible performance once again from Caitlin Clark. How about this one, folks? A uh, huge win for Iowa. 94 to 87 over LSU. The number one seed moves on. She gets revenge, does Caitlin Clark against Angel Reese and the Tigers. It was a 41 point performance last night. Tied an NCAA tournament record. Nine three pointers. Heading back to the final four. Iowa, once again, the story in college basketball all season long with Caitlin Clark. WNBA, Big Three. Which league is she headed toward next year? Maybe both. Who knows? Still some time to play, though, of course, in the NCAA tournament. Also, UConn defeats USC and the final last night, 80-73, to as you see there. So the number one seed in SC gets upset by UConn. I would say it's a pretty good year for Connecticut basketball, wouldn't you say? And they're going to face the number one seed, Iowa, on Friday for a spot in the national title game in the Final Four. It is the program's 23rd Final Four appearance. 15th in the past 16 women's NCAA tournament. So congratulations there as we head toward a lot more fun in the women's and men's side in the Final Four. All right, now in terms of some more college basketball news, the end has come for Andy Enfield more than a decade at USC. He is headed to SMU. And the Mustangs fired Rob Lanier last month after just two seasons at the helm, including this past year when they went 20 and 13 on the season. All right, in the National Basketball Association, we had a 50-point performance last night. It was Devin Booker, 52 points against the Pelicans, coming off a huge performance, 124 to 111. Now, the 52 points, by the way, for Booker makes him join Wilt Chamberlain as the only NBA players in history to have three consecutive games with 50 or more points against a single opponent. He also had 52 in their previous matchup January 19th. And also on December 17th, Booker had uh, 58 points. So how about this? New Orleans does not want to see Devin Booker around anytime soon. Also, Damian Lillard is out tonight against the Wizards because of a growing strain. Second straight game that Lillard has missed. He sat out Saturday's win against Atlanta for personal reasons. By the way, the Bucs are not playing particularly well without Lillard. Their record is 1-5 on the season. And Giannis is on the injured list. And so is uh, Chris Middleton. And so is Pat Beverly. So we'll see who ends up playing for them tonight. Meanwhile, in business and sports memorabilia news on the NBA side, Kobe Bryant, his uh, ring, his championship ring from the 2000 NBA season, which was gifted to his father, Joe Bryant, has ended up on the auction block and sold for $927,000 via Golden Auction. Uh, Incredible uh, piece of memorabilia that goes for almost a million dollars there. All right, now in Major League Baseball last night, we got the first no-hitter of the season. A bit of a surprise, unless you've been following the Houston Astros, because they just keep throwing no-hitters. It is Ronel Blanco, first no-hitter of 2024. He just had a daughter. He made his first opening day roster. And now he throws the first no-hitter in the majors this season. He struck out seven. He walked two. The Astros beat the Blue Jays by a final of 10 to nothing on Monday night. So Houston could not beat the Yankees, but they had no problem with the Blue Jays. Meanwhile, break it up. Is it time to start singing We Are Family? People don't even know what I'm talking about there. That's so far back. Our, our producer, Michael Cohen, not even born when, when uh, that song came out, I don't think. Uh, Pirates are 5-0 and oh for the first time since 1983. They win again. Brian Reynolds got on base again, 33 consecutive games. Michael A. Taylor had a few hits. They go to Miami and win. They win again last night. Congrats to them, 5-0 and for the first time since 1983. And also break up the Yankees. They make our run down yet again. We're on a Yankee streak here. We can't get away from them. 5-0 and for the first time since 1992. They beat the Diamondbacks by a final of 5-2 to last night. Anthony Volpe's gotten off to a great start, 4-4 four for four, uh, last night. Also, Detroit Tigers 
one of the sleepers in baseball this season. Uh, yeah, they're playing the White Sox. That's fine, but they also beat the Mets now. They're 4-0 and to start the season for the first time since 2015. So the Tigers in that division, which you would seem to be pretty winnable at this point, uh, getting off to a great start as well. So several teams, 4-0, 5-0 to start the year. Also, by the way, several teams 0-4, 0-5, but we can save that for another show. All right, now let's get to the latest in business and sports betting. We'll start with Ohio uh, sports betting revenue in February. The numbers have come in $67.7 million for Ohio, totaling uh, up to $672 million from all sources, up from 5% in February 2023. That puts Ohio, by the way, as far as the United States is concerned, fourth in the handle behind New York, New Jersey, and Nevada. Now, the this, uh, this story with Rashi Rice has taken yet another turn as his attorney has released a statement, and this is regarding a uh, traffic accident from over the weekend in Dallas. The Dallas uh, Morning News reported a vehicle that is believed to be registered or leased to Rice involved in a crash 6.20 p.m. local time on Saturday. The quote from the attorney is, on behalf of Rashi Rice, his thoughts are with everybody impacted by the automobile accident on Saturday, and he is cooperating with local authorities. We'll take all necessary steps to address the situation responsibly, but we have not yet heard from Rashi Rice himself, and I don't anticipate we will. Now, some real unfortunate news from the National Football League yesterday. Former player on the Miami Dolphins, Indianapolis Colts, uh, former great player too, uh, Vontae Davis, found dead, unfortunately, on Monday, 35 years old. Uh, investigation remains active there. Uh, also, one piece of news in the National Football League, Commander Carson has a new location at quarterback. Uh, he's moving on as the backup quarterback to Patrick Mahomes with the Kansas City Chiefs. So that's the latest there in the National Football League. All right, coming up next, it is the story that everybody will be watching in the National Basketball Association the rest of the day. Will Joel Embiid be back on the court for the Philadelphia 76ers? They have a huge matchup tonight against one of the best teams in the NBA in the Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, Gilbert McGregor will join us for a preview there. For those of you who are looking for more information about SportsGrid, maybe this is your first time watching the show. If you take out your phone, I'm going to help you out. Just scan this QR code. It is the SportsGrid app. Gives you more news, notes, information, sometimes some picks against the spread, but most importantly, information, data, and ways that you can watch and stream our show. It's available for both iOS and Android. It is the SportsGrid app. Scan it. It is absolutely free. Nothing to purchase there. So stay tuned because Gilbert McGregor is going to join us on the show. And then coming up after that, Mike Mazio weighs in as to whether or not we've seen the last of NCAA prop betting upcoming football. It looks like a lot of states may be putting an end to this. So we'll touch on that as well. This is Newswire on Sports Grid every Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern. And after this quick timeout, we'll preview tonight's NBA slate with Gilbert McGregor from Sporting News. sit on it right i mean there's, there's no way in the world we're not getting one more goal we're gonna cash this ticket cha-ching cha-ching i love the bet i love the price i think that's uh, like i said that's one we're gonna have to um i mean we're telling everybody right now they're probably moving it in risk groups everywhere right now based on us giving out this information in game live prime time only on sports grid talk all you want about how fat he is no one can guard him no one can stop him. He's a violent offender. He does whatever he wants in the low block and at the 10. He just does whatever he wants and scores at will at nauseam. They're the Mike Tyson of college basketball. At some point, they're going to throw a haymaker. And when it connects, Pharrell, you're not getting up. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on Sports Grid. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just, they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. 
I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat UConn. You got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim only on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back-to-back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka High. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game live. Prime time. Back-to-back just utterly stinker quarters. In-game live. Overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen and watch right now, you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Back to Newswire here on Sports Grid. Time to preview tonight's slate in the National Basketball Association. And for that, we have Gilbert McGregor from the Sporting News. As uh, we get ready, and Gilbert, it's almost playoff time here. And, uh, you know, for some players, it's time to get back on that court, right? Like, it's time to start getting ready for these games. Uh, you know, th- these rest days are going away here in a couple of weeks. And that's a great place to start because I guess we don't know if Joel Embiid is going to return tonight. But I would think... Gilbert, I mean, you could correct me if I'm wrong. That would be in his best interest to, like, play a game or two <laughs> before the playoffs begin because uh, it, it's ring rust is a, is a real thing here. Uh, rim rust, I should say, is a real thing. Ring rust is boxing. Uh, <laughs> rim rust is basketball. Uh, what do you think? You think Embiid is back tonight? Have you heard anything? Uh, it, it seems. He's got a few more hurdles that he needs to overcome to get back in, in the lineup. He's been out for about two and a half months. So uh, figuring that part of everything out, I think, is certainly important for them. They don't want to skip any steps to get him back on the floor. So I would expect him to be back at some point this week, just not tonight. Um, but like you said, Craig, um, they don't have much time to, to mess around. I think they have six or seven games remaining in this season. So you need a little bit of a runway uh, to get prepared for the postseason because it looks like this Sixers team is going to be playing in the play-in tournament. And when you get there, it's like a game seven every time. So if they want to get uh, out of the play-in tournament and into the NBA playoffs, they need Joel Embiid at least comfortable on the floor. But it is worth re- reminding everybody how good he was when he was playing on the floor. So if they can get 75 to 80% of that, they're still better than a lot of teams. Yeah, and, and I would say that based on the odds tonight, Gilbert, it doesn't appear that uh, Embiid is playing because I don't think FanDuel would make a line like this. I know Oklahoma City is clearly better than Philadelphia, but if Embiid was to play, I could not see them being five-and-a-half-point favorites on the road uh, at Philly. The total is 225 and a half. So let's make the fair assumption, as you're saying, that he is not playing. Can Maxi and company keep this close enough to make it a game? It'll be interesting to see, Uh, you know, Oklahoma City has found ways to win. They just had a comeback win against New York a few days ago, Uh, but they're dealing with some injuries as well. Shea Gildas Alexander has not looked like himself lately. He's dealing with the pesky quad injury. So now that they're in that three-way battle for the number one seed in the Western Conference, games are important for OKC, but at the same time, if you're the Thunder, the seeding matter that much to where your best player, your MVP candidate, enters the postseason not as close to 100% as he can be. So I'll be interested to see how the Thunder decide to manage 
things as far as that goes because they're battling with the Nuggets and the Timberwolves for that number one seed. But also, is the number one seed what you actually want? Because there's a good chance whoever finishes number one could face a team like the Lakers in the first round. So there's a lot of strategizing that's going to be going on. Obviously, people talk about, you know, don't duck anybody in the first round. But there's no secret that there are certain matchups that you would prefer to have in the first round. And a potential matchup with a team led by LeBron James or a team led by Steph Curry is not exactly the one you want to start your playoff journey. Yeah, and, and I would say that at this point, any team that's in that playing game, you make no assumptions at this point because, you know, you have some teams that get knocked out right away. You have some teams that or if they're in the playing game or not, they go far regardless. Uh, well, this one hurts for the Sacramento Kings. Uh, Malik Monk, who is having such a nice season for them, is going to be out for an extended period of time. They're calling it a sprained MCL four to six weeks. I did some extrapolation on the time here, Gilbert. And it does not appear to me, at least from this, that he's playing in the first round for the Kings. Now, we know how these injuries go. Sometimes they're reported as four to six weeks, and then the playoffs come, and then it's two to four weeks. And so I'll be on the optimistic side with that with Monk, but it seems like, at least for the time being, that they're going to have to do without him. This is a terrible blow uh, for the Kings because it's not long after Kevin Herter was already ruled out for the season with a shoulder injury. So now they're down a starter and their sixth man, who still is probably in line to be named sixth man of the year. So the Kings are down two rotational players. They're battling for positioning in the Western Conference. I just mentioned the play-in tournament picture. They don't have that big of a lead over the Lakers, who are right behind them. And the Lakers are in a soft part part of their schedule. So the Kings just dropped a few crucial games to the Mavericks. Um, They're in real danger of of falling to that 9-10 line, where you have to win one game to get a second opportunity to get that eighth seed. And without Kevin Herter, without Malik Monk, that's really hard to do, especially against the quality of teams they could play against in the play-in tournament. So um, unfortunately for them, this could spell the beginning of the end of their season, but they still have De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis, two all-star caliber players. Keegan Murray can step up. Harrison Barnes has been stepping up for this team, but is that too much to ask for those guys if they are in a game seven like situation in the play-in tournament against the team like the Lakers or the Warriors, whoever up getting matched up with, or the Suns also. So it's really no night off. There's really no uh, reprieve you get if you're in the play-in tournament, especially in the Western Conference. Yeah, fair enough. Now, in the Eastern Conference, it's coming down to the wire here as uh, the great rivalry game tonight between the Knicks and the Miami Heat. Uh, You know, certainly these are two teams that could face off uh, with each other in the playoffs at some point. Uh, Knicks are absolutely up against it, having several players out of this game. But the odds makers are telling us that, quite frankly, they don't know who's going to play for the Heat, Gilbert. And they also don't really fully trust the Heat. They're a really hard team to gauge, right? Like, this is a team they could win tonight by 30. They could lose tonight by 20. Uh, They're two and a half point favorites tonight on FanDuel. The total is 208. Uh, OG Ananobi is out. Julius Randle, of course, is out. Uh, Mitchell Robinson is day to day. But it's this, isn't this more about Miami than New York at this point? I mean, New York, we know where they're sort of headed. The, the Heat is that unpredictable team. You know what, Craig, you mentioned the rivalry. And one thing that's been consistent for as long as I've followed the NBA and been a fan of the NBA, you're going to get some type of slugfest between the Miami Heat and New York Knicks, regardless of who suits up in, in this game. I think the Knicks are dealing with their injuries. Uh, and this game, as you said, is a little more important for the Heat. They are right on that line. They could jump back into sixth place. We know that they were able to make a run from the play-in tournament last year, but I don't think they want to have to do that again. They're right on the Pacers' heels. Uh, A win would be crucial for them doing it on their home floor. Uh, The Knicks have been up and down. They had that 60-point performance for Jalen Brunson over the weekend, but it didn't result in a win. They actually lost to the San Antonio Spurs. So the Knicks are going to be a little motivated. I think they could use a win because there's still some jostling going on at the top of the Eastern Conference standings. But I think the Heat, I won't say they want it a little more. Everybody wants it. But it, it means a little bit more for this Heat team to, to jump out of seventh into sixth and have an opportunity to be in the first round and just lock up a playoff spot with a few games left to get it back ahead of, of the Pacers. Yeah, and, and I think a week from now, Gilbert, we'll really be focused in on a lot of the seeding. I mean, this could come down, it looks like, in some cases, to the very last games of the season. What, what do you think at this point is the biggest storyline for those teams at the bottom as we head toward that? Yeah, I think the interesting thing is is really more so this year than any other year, we have no idea how it's going to shape out. So when you talk about those teams at the bottom, 
except for the team that's going to finish eighth in the Eastern Conference. We know that Boston's going to finish first, but right. in the West and the Eastern Conference, you don't really know what's going to happen towards the top of the standings. So, you know, you get that sixth or seven, I mean, the seventh or eighth seed in the Western Conference. You have no idea if you're going to be playing against Minnesota or Denver, or Oklahoma City. Each team uh, provides different challenges, but I think of those three teams, Denver is the one that nobody wants to see, but you might end up finishing sixth thinking you can take a deep breath, but you're actually playing the Nuggets in the first round. So uh, I think the fact that teams can't manipulate the standings for an advantageous matchup last year, like we saw the Lakers with the, the Grizzlies in the first round, and we ended up seeing with the Heat and the Bucks in the first round last year, there won't be any of that because we have no idea who's going to land anywhere outside of the Celtics being first in the Eastern Conference. And who knows, if the Sixers can get Joel and B back, maybe they want to have an opportunity to see the Celtics in the first round because the Sixers were 26-8 and eight with Joel and B in the lineup before he went down. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah, no, it'll be a fun NBA playoffs. We're almost there. Get through that Final Four, of course, next week. Gilbert, great to see you here on the show, and we'll catch up again and talk about the National Championship next week. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. All right, Gilbert McGregor from Sporting News. Coming up next with the college basketball final four on the men's and women's side coming up this weekend. Is there a chance this is the final time you'll be able to bet on individual player props? Like Matthew tells us. I love the bet. I love the price. I think that's, uh, like I said, that's one we're going to have to, um, I mean, we're telling everybody right now. They're probably moving it in risk groups everywhere right now based on us giving out this information. In Game Live, prime time, only on Sports Grid. Talk all you want about how fat he is. No one can guard him. No one can stop him. He's a violent offender. He does whatever he wants in the low block and at the 10. He just does whatever he wants and scores at will at nauseam. They're the Mike Tyson of college basketball. At some point, they're going to throw a haymaker. And when it connects Pharrell, you're not getting up. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on Sports Grid. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat UConn. you got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim, only on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back-to-back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka high. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game live. Prime time. Back-to-back just utterly stinker quarters. In-game live. Overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now. You may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Welcome 
Welcome back to Newswire here on Sports Grid. It is a tenuous time for sports betting, at least on the college side, with a lot of news going on here about the potential of potentially uh, banning prop bets on individual players. Articles are coming out all over the country, both uh, locally and nationally, about uh, different topics. There's some new ones from The Athletic, of course, over at Legal Sports Report. They're covering this as well. So we're going to dive in now with Mike Mazio as he joins us here on the show. And Mike, great to have you back here. And like every day that turns here, there's, I mean, I, I, scandal's a little strong because, again, some of these things have to get fully investigated, but there definitely is a new uh, piece of this puzzle every day that seems to be coming out, and I know there's another one to begin the show with today. Yeah, Craig, just in The Athletic, a really good article by David Aldridge. Uh, you know, one thing I think people should note is, uh, before I talk about it, you know, uh, sports betting has been going on in Europe, you know, with the soccer team, so players there are probably more familiar with this than they are here, and They've adapted and there are scandals, but, you know, uh, nothing that can't be overcome. So in the NBA, uh, at least one team, according to David Aldridge's reporting, has added a security guard on its bench because of, you know, gambling, uh, gambling related threats. You know, these players may be hearing from fans in the stands of, you know, uh, how could you miss that three pointer? I had the over on that. You know, so those player props, which we'll talk about with NCAA, uh, that's something interesting. Another team had increased its uh, security online, cyber threats these mm. players may be facing from betters via social media, you know, direct messages. They, a lot of guys have said they've gotten Venmo requests. You know, Tyrese Halliburton said, for a lot of people, I'm just a prop to them. Bernie Bickerstaff, the coach of the Cavs, has said, I've gotten threats, you know, uh, to my family from losing betters. So, again, this is the new normal. The leagues had to know this when they signed up, you know, to take this partnership money. Uh, they're getting, you know, in the NBA, 167 million, which is split between the players and the owners. Players can have the non-passive investments in these gambling companies. So, you know, in that collective bargaining agreement, the players do have some benefits. But, you know, this is the new normal. It, it is what it is. Hopefully, fans, you know, act uh, in an acceptable manner or face some sort of prosecution, and perhaps, you know, at the criminal level. Who knows? Depending on how big these threats are, you hope that doesn't come to that. But you know, given how much money is at stake and how the players probably don't care if a guy loses 20, 50 bucks on a game. Uh, but, you know, they can hear it in their DMs and it's it probably not comforting. Uh, despite that they're making tons of money, you know, it's not comforting to hear anything bad. So, yeah. And then, you know, Dana O'Neill also in a, in a separate article talking about how, uh, you know, these uh, walk-on players that get in in blowout games, they're getting threats now uh, for yeah. potentially uh, making a shot that it, you know, might be the only shot they make in their career but cost somebody money in the spread. So we, we're going to talk about player props. Obviously, that seems like it's going to end in a lot of states. But, you know, these these lines and, and totals are still there. And, you know, unfortunately, these walk on players who are living out their dream playing a couple minutes, you know, can affect these betting lines. So, you know, the new normal, everyone's going to have to adapt to it. Yeah, they will. And, and I would say that it, it's really fascinating to me surrounding college. Professional is shocking to me that any, anybody would get involved in it with the money that's going around. I, I suppose even with these 10 day contracts, but, you know, Mike, when, when legalized sports betting came about, it, it's, it's just so odd to me that they never thought like, hey, look, this is a possibility. Like this could happen with the player props. The game outcomes is, to me is a completely different story. Now it's like, let's, let's run as fast as we can and now take two steps back. And the two steps back are from the NCAA at this point, Mike. They want to stop uh, betting on player props. They want this ending. There are nine states right now that do not restrict player props. Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Michigan, Montana, Nevada, North Carolina, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Mike, I got I got an opinion here on this. Uh, I, I think I think player props may be going away in, in college sports. Now I don't I'm not saying that this is good or bad for sports betting. Some people may be upset with it, but this seems to be to me the first shoe to drop, and then I wonder what goes from there. Do you have an opinion on that? Do you know what what do you think which way this goes? Yeah, Craig, I agree. I think you know what what Ohio said, right? That it made up such a small percentage. It was like over a percent of uh, all handle they took. So it, it, you know, maybe for the states, you know, tax revenue wise, even if even you know, aside from the harassment these players are facing, you know, they just say, hey, it's not worth it. We don't we don't want these complaints. This isn't a big portion of the pie for us. Uh, and so yeah, you could see a lot of states doing it because the NCAA now is contacting them and saying, please take this away. We don't want to hear. You know, Anthony Grant at Dayton was one of the first coaches you know, a year ago to say, you know, my players are getting harassed. Fans need to be better than this. Uh, clearly they haven't been because every college has, you know, the, their players are hearing it. The pro players are hearing it. So yeah, Louisiana seems to be the first state to respond. They didn't say if they're going to get rid of it, but their gaming control board did say they're going to address it in the next day or two. And they said, we're happy. We were proactive. We did it before the NCAA reached out to a lot of 
these jurisdictions that are offering it. I agree with you. I think this is uh, the end of player props. You know, it's not going to be because they're going to be betting them offshore, and that's disappointing because you always want to have the regulation there, and potentially that nefarious activity can't be spotted. But, yeah, I think this is probably a PR win for the NCAA to get rid of this. We don't want our athletes to be harassed. Maybe people are still betting offshore, but hopefully it's not the influx that we're betting on the legal sites, the Fandles, the DraftKings, Caesars, MGM, all those sites. So I agree. I think it's going away. Whether it's good or bad, we'll see. We'll see what the reaction is. Maybe these players still face the threats because people are betting right. on Bovada, the other you know, uh, illegal offshore sites. But I agree. I think it's going away, and I think it'll be a you know, win for the operators uh, to get rid of it, You know, the jurisdictions to get rid of it, and we'll see where it goes from here. All right, let's get to Florida now. And, uh, you know, Hard Rock has this, you know, the, the, the betting app. They're the only ones in the state. There's a group that has been fighting them tooth and nail for years now. The name of the group is West Flagler. They filed a supplemental brief to the Supreme Court of the United States. This in the midst, Mike, of living in Florida, I can tell you, one of the bigger advertising campaigns that's going on right now by the Hard Rock. They're airing commercials like crazy. Uh, you know, during the, the games on Valley Sports in Florida, whether it's the Heat or the Panthers or the Marlins, and, and probably going on, I'm assuming, in Tampa Bay as well. But I'm watching these by local market, like every, every commercial break now. They hadn't been doing this, but they're there. Uh, advertising, Mike, as the only sports betting app in Florida that is legal. Boy, this way, and they're under the skin of this West Flagler, right? Like, they're not going to quit fighting until they see some sort of resolution. I just don't see one coming for them. Yeah, Craig, and it's like you said, it's risen to the top court in the land. Uh, we'll see where this goes. Uh, West Flagler submitted supplemental brief. You know, at, at issue is really whether the tribe should be able to offer uh, online sports betting off tribal land. The D.C. Circuit Courts, and now Florida Supreme Court says, you know, they are authorized. This, this Indian uh, Regulatory Gaming Act uh, allows for tribes to be able to, in this case, their Hard Rock Seminole tribe, to be able to allow you know, online sports betting off their tribal lands. And that's kind of the center here. So yeah, West Flagler, which has been fighting this tooth and nail, spending tons of money, you know, lawyers making tons of money on this, whatever way it goes. Uh, and so this is going to take a while because the Supreme Court has to figure out, one, if they want to hear the case, and two, how long it's going to take for them to have an answer. Uh, so this may not be decided until sometime in 2025, regardless of which way they rule. We know the Supreme Court only takes like 2% of cases it hears. And so, um, excuse me. Uh, it's a long shot, you know, in any, in any event, but, you know, West Flagler is going to take this to the top court. And so we'll see what happens here. But like you said, all, all eyes on Florida and the industry, definitely California is paying a lot of attention given the hub and spoke model and the tribal interest there. So, you know, this is a big case, has lasting ramifications, and uh, there's going to be more filings. I think April 12th is the time the Department of the Interior has to respond to West Flagler's filing. So, yeah, a lot to come here. We'll be all over it and significant ramifications one way or the other. Yeah, it looks like it could come to an end or the start of a new fight. I guess we'll see. Uh, okay, uh, March Madness, huge moneymaker for the sports books. And we've got some numbers in, Mike, as you said, on social media from New York. I mean, this is uh, sort of crazy to think in the infancy, which we are at in sports betting, that in such a short period of time, so much money can be bet. And it just shows the magnitude of how popular the tournament is. Yeah, Craig, uh, $540 million in New York from uh, March 18th to 24th. Uh, New York sports betting is around since January 22, so more than two years now. This is the second highest total, and I think the highest total was right when it started, right when everybody was jumping on with all the offers. So, yeah, it shows you, you know, football is king. The NFL, you know, weeks one through 17 in the playoffs, but it might be nothing like the NCAA tournament in terms of interest with just so many games, so many upsets, everybody doing a, a bracket at their office or with their friends and, so, yep. yeah, these, this, these numbers continue to pile up. They're incredible. And, uh, you know, New York continues to set the bar for the industry with Florida, Texas, and California still yet to legalize. It's still the biggest market. And there's clearly a demand here. And so the sports books aren't going to stop offering. There are going to be tons of offers, and we'll see where it goes. Yeah. Do you think, Mike, that – I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to predict because football season is still four or five months away. But it would seem to me that if there's any record to be broken, it would be this upcoming year for the uh, for the college and pro football season. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, and the fact that the women, you know, Caitlin Clark going off. So you've got the, you know, the LSU Iowa game with, you know, almost 7 million people watching it and tons of people betting there. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised, Craig, if it is, uh, you know, given everybody wanting to know if UConn's going to go back to back here. They look like very formidable going on 30 runs. 
you know, there's lots of interest here, you know, not only in just the, the games, but the players, the storylines, the narratives, uh, you know, a huge uh, cash cow probably for the NCAA. And I think the sports books, you know, certainly getting tons of interest handle, you know, we'll see what the revenues are uh, just huge across the board as we head into the final four here. All right. Well, Mike, great to see you again. Thanks for all the updates. We'll catch up again soon. Thanks so much, Craig. Have a great week. All right, Mike Mazio from Legal Sports Report here with us. All right, coming up next, it's time for us to dive into the upcoming PGA Tour event, the appetizer before the main course. The Texas Open is this week, folks. The Masters is next week. So we got Brady Cannon coming up on the show. We'll preview everything that we can expect in the upcoming Texas Open and take a look back at a wild finish to the Houston Open with another surprise winner on the PGA Tour. Uh, also, don't forget, we're right back here for our next edition of Newswire. That is tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. Lots of baseball discussion on the show today. The first game in baseball starts at 4 p.m. Eastern, but tomorrow, uh, a full slate of games in the early afternoon. So we'll have a preview of those as well. So stick with us here on Newswire. We're back after these quick messages where it's smarter to be on sports. Well, don't go away. I love the bet. I love the price. I think that's, uh, like I said, that's one we're going to have to, um, I mean, we're telling everybody right now. They're probably moving it in risk rooms everywhere right now based on us giving out this information. In Game Live, prime time, only on Sports Grid. Talk all you want about how fat he is. No one can guard him. No one can stop him. He's a violent offender. He does whatever he wants in the low block and at the 10. He just does whatever he wants and scores at will at nauseam. They're the Mike Tyson of college basketball. At some point, they're going to throw a haymaker. And when it connects, Pharrell, you're not getting up. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on Sports Grid. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat you, Kyle. you got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim, only on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win, and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head -head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is, you're either winning your rebuild in game live all access nobody has been more profitable as a dog than shaka smart team winning back to back road games I, I don't care if they're playing topeka high i i wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever in game live prime time back to back just utterly stinker quarters in game live overtime honestly as, as you sit here and listen watch right now you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid.
PGA Tour is getting ready for the upcoming Masters Tournament. It is a week from Thursday. It all begins, of course. So we got an appetizer this week in the Texas Open. We're going to preview that. First, let's recap what happened this past week on the PGA Tour. Brady Cannon, as always, joins us now to do that. Uh, Brady, you know, certainly next week is going to be an incredible week. I mean, the Masters week is is so amazing. So many wagering options now that they're going to have available FanDuel, DraftKings, everywhere else. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. So let, let's take a little <laughs> bit of a rewind here uh, and then forward to this week. And then we can do the Masters next week. Thanks again for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. It, it really is an interesting handicap this week. And, you know, anything, any tournament prior to a major always is. Uh, and you have a good field this week. You know, it's often that a lot of the Europeans come in uh, into the United States to get a practice round in, so to speak, mm -hmm. before Augusta National. Tommy Fleetwood, Matt Fitzpatrick, uh, you know, some of the guys that you might not normally see at this event, Max Homa, Colin Morikawa, they're all here. And Rory McIlroy is the headliner and the favorite this week. And I mentioned the handicap is interesting because – I, I mean, is Rory McIlroy truly here? Is he 100% committed to win the Valero Texas Open? Or is he here to get a few swings in and kind of tune the game up in the arena of formal competition uh, to get ready for Augusta National? I, I kind of believe the latter, that you know he's here to kind of just work some kinks out and see how the game feels in a competitive environment and, and then see what he can do next week. So Rory, for me, is certainly not going to be on my outright card or top 20 or anything like that. If anything, and I, and I have not made a bet uh, involving Rory McIlroy, but if anything, I'd probably be looking to go against him in like a head-to-head -head matchup or something. And I haven't seen who the odds makers have paired him with. But, you know, I, I landed on six guys this week, Craig. Three of them are already in the Masters field, and three of them are trying to get in this week. So. This week is very important for guys that are not in to the Masters field just yet. They can do so with a win. If you win the Valero Texas Open and you're not already in the Masters, that will earn you a ticket uh, next week. And then the other thing is if you can move up in the world ranking points to get to number 50 or better, the top 50 players in the world rankings will also get to play in the Masters. So you've got one more shot to qualify uh, with either either avenue there, either winning the event or getting into the world's top 50. Yeah, and, and I think, it, to me, uh, from looking at some of the names here, Brady, and again, uh, Ludwig Aberg, I believe is his name, 11-1, to 1, right behind uh, Rory McIlroy. Uh, and, and, and honestly, I am not that familiar with this name here. And to think that he is basically one of the favorites to win this one, and I know you actually like him in terms of a top 20 finish. So being that I am not all that familiar with his game, uh, he pops in, I'm assuming, with a tune-up also for the Masters, but with a real opportunity to cash some tickets here too. He is one heck of a player, Craig. And it's, it's no shame in not being very familiar with him because he's really only been on the scene for probably less than a year. Uh, he came out of Texas Tech, and that's one of the reasons I like him. He's very familiar with this golf course, having attended college at Texas Tech. In fact, he played in this tournament in 2022 on a special invite, but he is loaded with talent. He was on the European Ryder Cup team and did very well there. He won the RSM Classic uh, uh, earlier last fall. That was his first PGA Tour victory. And if you look at the stats, I mean, he does everything well. He, he just drives it really long and straight, strokes gained approach. He's even 25th in this field for strokes gained putting on Bermuda grass the last 36 rounds. But, I, I mean, I'm not sure what his world ranking is, but he's probably already into the top 20. He's that good. And certainly mm. one of the class players in this field. He's already in the Masters with that win at the RSM Classic. But... He's a guy that I landed on. You know, I mentioned Rory McIlroy. I don't think the motivation is 100% for him this week. But for Aberg or Oberg is, I guess, how we are supposed, uh, pr supposed to pronounce it now. Um, you know, I think this tournament is special to him because he spent so many years, you know, playing this golf course while he was in college. And he's such a good player. So, And he's young. He kind of doesn't know any better. Rory's still chasing that career grand slam, right? So right. Oberg was a guy I landed on for an outright win, an awful short price. I got him at 13. 
Uh, I also played him for a top 20 finish. Uh, another guy I landed on was Hideki Matsuyama at 23 to one. Another guy that's already in the Masters, a lifetime invite there as a winner in 2021. But it's very interesting if you look at Hideki in his trips to the Valero Texas Open in 2021, he finished 30th before he went on to win the Masters the next week. And then last year he finished 15th leading up to the Masters. So it tells me that this guy is not taking a week off necessarily. He's still competing. And then I went with Corey Connors at 30 to one. He's a two-time winning here, uh, winner here, including the defending mm. champion. So it, that tells me as well, Corey Connors has had multiple top 10 finishes at the Masters, but the week prior, he's been a tournament winner at the Valero. So, you know, three guys there that are already in the Masters field, but they haven't shown me any signs that they're taking this week off or, or they're using it as a practice round. Yeah, fair enough. And uh, the Masters is really going to be the focal point for uh, everyone, I, I think, coming next week. And what's really cool is to see some of the bigger names back again. And John Rahm will lead the list of those uh, at 13 to 1 going into the Masters next week. Now, Scotty Scheffler has to be the favorite. In fact, he's more of a prohibitive favorite than Rahm was going into this last year, Brady, at four, plus 430, which is it's insane. I mean, usually 5-1 to one was the lowest I can remember seeing. Rory at 11-1, to one, Brooks Kepka 19-1. to one. Let's not rule out Victor Hovland and some others. There's always a surprise at the Masters, too. Well, you still have some time, I know, to handicap this before they tee off next Thursday morning. Have you taken an early look at some of the potential winners in the tournament? Oh, yes, of course. It's an annual tradition. You know, these odds are up since like October. So <laughs> it gives you so much time to to peruse that Masters Futures board. And, you know, I mean, there's been years past where, you know, I'll see a guy listed at 100 or 150 to one. And by the time we get to April, I've got like 12 futures, which is probably too many. Uh, but right now, I only have four. Uh, and you're right. The field is really loaded. You know, the Masters... Uh, you know, governing body invited Joaquin Neiman, uh, a live golfer uh, to this event. And I think he is deserved of that uh, invitation. He's tried to qualify all over the world. He hasn't only been playing in live events and he's certainly one of the class players in the world. Uh, and then of course, Dustin Johnson and Brooks Kepka and, you know, Mickelson and John Rahm. So yeah, it, it's a loaded field for sure. You, you mentioned Scotty Scheffler. Uh, I believe I read yesterday his odds of plus 450 is the shortest price uh, in the Masters to win it since Tiger in, in around wow. 2007 or so. You know, Tiger for many years, I want to say, I don't know, 2000 through 2013 or something like that. He, he was lower than four to one. He was like plus 350. Mm. But Scotty is the oh. lowest price since that time. And I haven't landed on him. These are guys that I've played over the course of probably the last three or four months. Um, I took Justin Thomas, got him at 34 to one. And I think we were given that price because he had a lousy year last year. Now he's off to a pretty darn good start this year. Uh, did not have a good week. Started out great at the Valspar, was the favorite going into the weekend and then just fell all over himself uh, over the weekend. Um, but I, but he has had a very promising year, and hopefully he's peaking at the right time. Uh, got him at 34 to 1. I took Jordan Spieth at 22. I, I think Jordan Spieth at better than 20 to 1 is just an automatic at the Masters. I mean, he is just an absolute horse for this course. He's probably got a better track record than anybody in, in the last five or 10 years at this golf course, including a win, a couple of runner-ups, you name it. The guy is just always seemingly in the top five at this golf course. Uh, and then I took Jason Day at 50 to one, who's had a, a nice year, uh, a couple of top 10 finishes on the West Coast, uh, just missed the cut by one shot last week, but I think he's still in fine form and 50 to one was a pretty decent number. A and then uh, uh, one more stab on Willie Zalatoris, uh, who is off to a good start this year and, you know, has had a couple of hiccups the last couple of weeks, but, you know, had a couple of really good finishes on the West Coast and, has had two top 10 finishes here in two tries at Augusta with a runner up and a sixth place finish. So those are the four guys I have currently in pocket. And by the time we get to next Thursday, I'll probably have another four, probably go in with about eight, seven or eight guys uh, for outrights to win the masters. 
Uh, la- last thing, Brady, before we go, uh, we didn't even get to this. Uh, Steven Yeager ends up winning the Houston Open last week. I know the field wasn't formidable, but I think what we've seen this year is when the field's a little bit thinner, none of the favorites win. I mean, this this has been a recurring theme all year. Yeah, he was in the neighborhood of 50 to 1 and, and a very good wow. player, much improved over the last few years. Uh, he had two third place finishes going in. Uh, it was at uh, Torrey Pines, where he was uh, a leader for a minute at the Farmers Insurance Open, and another tournament recently. I can't uh, recall exactly what it was. And, I, and I'm kicking myself, Craig, because I went back and looked at my notes, and he checked so many boxes for me mm-hmm. that I should have made him a play. And, and of course, I laid off. But I did have a couple of good top 20 finishes with Alex Noren and Billy Horschel. And I'm back on those two guys this week, Norin and Horschel for a top 20 and an outright win this week in Texas, and also Christian Bezadenhut. There are three guys that rank uh, Bezadenhut is 58th, Norin is 66th, and Horschel is 87th in the world rankings. They've all been playing excellent as of late and really throughout the entire beginning of the season. And they are not yet in that master's field. So a good, a really good finish can put them into that top 50 in the world ranking, or of course a win here this week will get them into the masters. So, you know, I think it's hard to gauge. It's that uh, psychological handicap, Craig, you know, does that motivation, does that pressure, is that pressure a good thing to play really well to get into the masters or is it a bad thing? Do they maybe become too aggressive? They make mistakes and, and they fall all over themselves I'm going to take a chance with these guys being in really good current form, being a good fit for this golf course this week, and having that motivation to get into the Masters as a positive. So those were the six guys I landed on for outrights and top 20 finishes, Oberg, Matsuyama, and Connors, and then Alex Noren, Billy Horschel, and Christian Bezaden. All right. Well, everything... I think revolves around Augusta National next week. So I'm hopeful, Brady, that you and I will talk before the tournament because by the time this time comes next week, oh my gosh, over on FanDuel and DraftKings, you talk about betting options. <laughs> so many for this Masters, hundreds and you know, hundreds matchups. Go ahead, Brady. Yeah. Uh, I, I heard from a friend of mine who uh, does all the golf business, all the golf odds making here at the Westgate uh-huh. Superbook in town, Jeff Sherman. And he said the Masters handle, the, 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 the betting volume on the Masters is 10 times bigger than, no, not at a regular PGA Tour event, 10 times bigger than any of the other majors is wow. what they will draw on the Masters. It, yeah, it's the biggest golf betting event of the entire year. All right, we'll cover it for you next week. Great to talk to you, Brady. Have a great weekend. Good luck with your picks for the Texas Open. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Craig. Enjoy the baseball, my friend. I will. All right. Coming up next, speaking of which, baseball is really good in Pittsburgh right now. And they haven't even played a home game. We'll be right back. sit on it right i mean there's no way in the world we're not getting one more goal we're gonna cash this ticket cha-ching cha-ching i love the bet i love the price i think that's uh, like i said that's one we're gonna have to um i mean we're telling everybody right now they're probably moving it in risk rooms everywhere right now based on us giving out this information in game live prime time only on sports grid talk all you want about how fat he is no one can guard him no one can stop him. He's a violent offender. He does whatever he wants in the low block and at the 10. He just does whatever he wants and scores at will, at nauseum. They're the Mike Tyson of college basketball. At some point, they're going to throw a haymaker. And when it connects, Pharrell, you're not getting up. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on Sports Grid. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third, 
in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat you, Kyle. You got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim only on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is you're either winning your rebuild in game live all access nobody has been more profitable as a dog than shaka smart team winning back-to-back road games i, I don't care if they're playing topeka high i i wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever in game live prime time to back just utterly stinker quarters in game live overtime honestly as, as you sit here and listen watch right now you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. back to Newswire as we get ready to wrap up the show. Where were you in 1983? If you were a Pirates fan, you were loving life because Pittsburgh at that time was 5-0, and and it's the last time they were 5-0 and until after last night. The Pirates win yet again. They have the best record in baseball. Remember last April? They also had a really good month. But, boy, does this time seem to be a little different. They got young pitchers on the way. Jared Jones got his first start underway, looked really good. They have Paul Skeens potentially coming up. The hitting has been uh, good as well. And is it possible that they are one of the surprise stories of the Major League Baseball season? Again, it's still only five games in, but they're doing all of this on the road, uh, coming back in games that they're probably not supposed to win. So a really impressive start for uh, the Pirates, their starters, their bullpen, some timely hitting. And as you see there, they got O'Neill Cruz at shortstop. They even won without him playing on Sunday, too. So break up the Buccos, break up the Pirates. You may remember, for those of you who go way back like me, in 1979, they uh, won the World Series and their song that they played, the We Are Family. I wonder if that's coming back uh, for this year. But I, I know that's dating myself. Most of you streaming right now have no idea what I'm even talking about. And probably before you were born. But I'm a little bit on the older side, despite what people say. Uh, Congrats to the Pirates. Sweeping the Marlins, winning again last night. They're 5-0 on the season. All right, that'll do it for the show. Thanks to Gilbert McGregor from Sporting News. Again, thanks to Mike Mazio from Legal Sports Port. Brady Cannon here from Sports Grid. In addition, thanks to our associate producer, Frank, our producer, Michael Cohen. I'm Craig Mish. As a reminder, early line coming up next. Pharrell, coast to coast, 3 o'clock Eastern. Plenty of games tonight in the NBA and something that we didn't even talk about. I don't know if they're going to handicap it tonight. But we're down to four teams in the NIT tournament. I mean, what would you prefer, the NIT or UFL football? Did anybody watch UFL, by the way, over the weekend? We didn't recap that at all. Anyway, I prefer the NIT. Go Seton Hall tonight. I'll see you tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern, for our next edition of Newswire. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you then.